I'm so happy today to have Andy No here. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, I have really been wanting to get you on the show, and I'm glad you made time for my show. My pleasure. You know, I've done interviews with media internationally all over the world, um, but very rarely do I get to speak to a fellow Portlander, um, Portland, where I'm from. So it's, uh, it's special and important to me uh, that I get this opportunity. So thank you for the invite. Yeah, no problem. Um, I wanted to just start saying, start by saying thanks for writing this New York Post article about the DA race. It was really comprehensive. It gives a great kind of timeline of events. Um, and by the time this episode comes out, we'll probably be finding out who wins or in the next few days. So, but yeah, I'll put a link to it in the, in the. Well, let's recap the importance of the district attorney's race in Multnomah County. Mike Schmidt is the current prosecutor. He was elected in 2020, took office in August 2020, and is making an, a case that he, Portlanders, or, or those in Monomah County, I should say, should uh, elect him for another four years. In my piece, I go over his legacy over the last four years, one a legacy that he is trying to gaslight us about. So I recap the... BLM Antifa riots of 2020, when he came into power in August 2020, which was at the height of the nightly riots, his office within days announced a policy that they would not be prosecuting a whole class of riot-related crimes, such as felony rioting, uh, harassment, uh, attempted escape, interfering with a police officer. And this really set the tone for how the remainder remainder of the summer went as well as into the autumn the rioters felt emboldened naturally they viewed that they had an ally in the da's office and in the inauguration speech that schmidt gave he repeatedly chanted black lives matter and before just days before he went into office he did a live stream on his facebook where he seemed to suggest uh, that in his view, property destruction and vandalism is needed to get the attention of politicians. Mike said this? He did. Yeah. So unsurprisingly, what happened is through that summer of violence, we had nightly riots in Portland. You and I were there at that time. It's a bit surreal thinking about that time, just because when I describe it, it, it seems a bit unbelievable in that you could have organized groups announcing where they're going to be, at what time, what to bring, what to wear, to show up at this place, and people would show up and then riot. They pre-announced it, would carry it out and do it night after night after night police sometimes made arrests. They actually made a lot of arrests. There were around a thousand people who were arrested over the months of rioting. And 90% of those cases were no complaint by the DA's office, no complaint in the local jargon. Um, in the courts here, it means that the prosecutors are choosing not to prosecute the charges at this time. And in some of the really egregious felony violent cases, like those who did felony arson, really serious assault, they got, the Antifa suspects got sweetheart plea deals where really serious violent felonies would be pleaded down and they would get no jail time, they would get no prison time, they would get probation, for example, and quite often they would get these um, deferred resolution deals where after a period of probation, a year or two years, the felony conviction would be expunged from their record. Mm. So out of all the rioters that were um, charged, and there weren't very many that were actually prosecuted, none of them actually went to trial if they involved a far left suspect. To date, there there has not been a single Antifa suspect, Antifa member, or far left riot suspect who actually um, was convicted at trial. They were all given sweetheart plea deals. Yeah. So I go over that 
period in 2020, 2021 in that New York Post piece, and also detail how uh, I spoke to sources who uh, were former Multnomah County uh, prosecutors who worked under Mike Schmidt, and they let me know that he created an atmosphere of chaos in the office where he, he being Schmidt, prioritized how he would be perceived in the media. So in his view at that time, he thought that the public and the media would like it if he didn't prosecute left-wing political violence and instead only pursue uh, charges against right-wing criminal suspects, which the office did, mm -hmm. took it to trial on a number of occasions, uh, convicted Proud Boy members or Proud Boy affiliates, um, but those who committed the same crimes uh, for far less violent causes got either sweetheart deals or not prosecuted at all. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking too, when you said that there, you know, I had Nathan Vasquez on here and he talked about, there's a lot of those uh, uh, prosecutors who left his office. Like there's a lot of them. So it doesn't surprise me that you were able to find if some that were willing to talk to you. <laughs> That were unhappy, and I know he's also had a number of complaints uh, from women in his office. That, Correct. Yeah. Um, actually, a state agency found that he, uh, his office had a culture of misogyny. This was following some formal complaints. Um, let's also uh, remind everyone here that Schmidt campaigned for Measure One Hundred and Ten, mm -hmm. which was a ballot initiative by Democrats in twenty twenty uh, that passed in in. Uh, for the state that decriminalized hard drugs. It made it merely uh, was a citation now to be, for example, in possession of fentanyl or meth or heroin, very addictive, dangerous drugs. And the outcome of that was rather predictable. We had hundreds of people overdosing and dying mm -hmm. every year, uh, particularly on fentanyl. Downtown Portland became an open air drug market, and in my view, an open insane asylum. Drug paraphernalia that's been used is discarded all over parts of downtown. There's human feces everywhere, and at various times, there are these sprawling homeless encampments. So, this is all under the tenure mm -hmm. of Mike Schmidt. And the damage that he has done to Portland, Multnomah County. In my view, it's it's really going to last a generation, even if he's voted out. In these four years, the the normalization of political violence, for example, from Antifa and the far left, the networks that were able to be established over months and months of rioting, and the money and the ability to react to it very quickly happened under uh, his tenure because he chose not to break up some of these criminal organized gangs that operate in Portland. The deaths from drugs and the culture of drug abuse is going to be part of Portland for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, not to mention there's a record uh, homicide rate as well, I believe. Correct. I talked about that mm -hmm. uh, in the piece. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, there were Portland had back to back all time record highs for mm -hmm. homicides. Mm -hmm. We've also for the first time in decades, have experienced a population decline for the mm -hmm. last three years in a row. People are leaving. And the destruction to businesses in Portland is really severe as well. Of course, um, small businesses closed during the pandemic and the months of rioting and the months of serious public safety issues in downtown. But it's not just small businesses, even really big brand names like Walmart, REI, Nike, and many other businesses have either downsized their operations in Portland or left entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was thinking it's just such a perfect storm of, because we also had this city council push in 2020 to defund the police here. And a lot of people mm -hmm. argue with me about that, but that didn't even happen. I believe there's a city council vote on it. And, you know, it, it was very official and it was definitely- They did officially yeah. defund. Uh, and then, yes, police were refunded. This is what happened across cities in America because it, that was actually really unpopular to voters when they actually experienced what it was like to have mm. a smaller police force 
or officers leaving through resignations or changing to other police departments. Portland's law enforcement numbers is still at catastrophically yeah. low numbers. That's why I was brought it up because we're still at record low staffing. And like you said, I agree with you that it's going to take decades to rebuild at least that public safety aspect. Um, but Yes, this is the danger of the mainstreaming of the BLM and Antifa narratives. Many decent people then in, uh, incorporated into their own beliefs hatred of police. Mm -hmm. And that sentiment is really normal in portland um it's a portland has a brain virus where too many residents hate police and are sympathetic to criminals mm -hmm. particularly violent criminals and um the fact that that has created um in normalizing just criminality you can see it in the data, in the hard data. You can't deny the number of people that have been shot and killed. The, the number of people who have survived, um, I, I mean, uh, non-fatal shootings in Portland have tripled as well mm. under Mike Schmidt's time. So you have like this surge in homicides, in shootings, in theft, in other crimes. Portland is a is a dangerous place to be in. In fact, uh, some reporting that came out just recently based on new FBI data on violent crimes uh, in the state of Oregon, Oregon and Washington now have moved way up um, in the US among where they rank in terms of being the most dangerous states. Yeah, I think we're in the top 10, right? Or something like that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll put a link to the, the New York Post article. I just thought it was great. Um, and yeah, uh, I wanted to also shout you out because you were kind of instrumental to me in setting up this show. I kind of started reaching out to you when I shifted at the end of 2019 and had run-ins with Antifa, just DMing you like news articles. And you were just very generously responsive. And some people can be very closed off, but you were just really receptive to me. And I appreciate that. And it sort of shifted my thinking into looking at Portland as a very closed-minded place, which I'm trying to change. But... I just want to thank you for that. Um, and yeah, um, no, my pleasure. I, I want to add a bit to that. Yeah. I, uh, it's really important to encourage people who are brave and are taking a risk and speaking out or creating content or writing or doing videos or commentary. And in Portland, there are not very many people, unfortunately, who are brave uh, when it comes to challenging the orthodoxy that exists here on various political beliefs and political um uh, there's a lot of denial about the realities of things in here and, and what has caused some of those uh decline in quality of life so i saw that you were brave and uh i'm glad that if i had any role in encouraging to continue to pursue this line of inquiry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, before I get into this sort of uh, dissecting Antifa stuff, obviously I have the book here. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more about it, I think this is like the definitive source of truth about it. And being somebody who's had personal run-ins with Antifa, I can definitely vouch for all the information in here. Like it's totally legit. Um, this will lay everything out in uh, Unmasked, your book. Um, but yeah, before I get into like some of these detailed questions about it, I wanted to, I wanted you to tell your story of how your parents came here because I just think that's really interesting in, in your back in your background. So I was born in Portland, Oregon, and raised here. This is my home. I've had to leave uh, a few years ago because of repeated violence and death threats against me from Antifa. Uh, but my parents came to Portland as refugees uh, from Vietnam. My, both my parents went through, grew up through the Vietnam War. They were from the former South Vietnam. And they, after 1975, which was the fall of Saigon, both of my parents uh, were imprisoned for different reasons. Uh, they were quite young. My father was in his early 20s. He went to a prison camp because he worked in law enforcement at that time for a small town in uh, the south of Vietnam, and under the new communist regime that took over the re the reunified country, 
of North and South Vietnam together as one. They persecuted anybody who had an affiliation with the former South Vietnamese government. If you were in the military, if you were in government somehow, if you were family of um, people in government even, you could be sent to what they called re-education camps, which is they sent you in the middle of nowhere in a jungle to do hard labor and uh, to be systematically brainwashed into communist propaganda. Uh, my mother was 16 years old uh, in 1975, and her family was sent to a labor camp because she came from a upper middle class family that had wealth and property, which was all confiscated. So uh, from the mid 70s throughout the 80s, there was a really large diaspora of refugees uh, out of Vietnam. They fled because um, Vietnam, particularly in the South, for the first time was experiencing food shortages under a centrally planned um, communist economy, uh, severe persecution by the state. And so people risked everything and fled. Most of them fled as uh, boat refugees. They left on small boats off the southern coast of Vietnam, and they would go to UN camps that were established in neighboring countries for help. Um, and at those camps, the refugees from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos would uh, apply for asylum in different countries. My parents were very fortunate that the United States took them in. So my parents came as legal refugees. Um, that process of application happened bef way uh, before they set any foot on American soil. So it's very different from the migrant crisis that America has been experiencing for us a number of years now on mm -hmm. the southern border where people show up with no documentation intentionally, passing through a number of safe countries and claiming asylum and then skipping out on their court dates and disappearing yeah. into the interiors. I think a lot of people would call it abusing the asylum system, whereas your parents seem like it was legitimate, yeah. So I was born in 87, a number of uh, my parents arrived in the U.S. in 79. Uh, my father was sent to Portland. My mother uh, was sent to San Francisco, and then they reunited in Portland. They decided, um, they met at the refugee camp, actually, in Indonesia. It was there that they decided they would pursue a life together in America. They were both very lucky that both of them were uh, being settled in the same country. So I was born a number of years later. I have an older sister as, as well and um, grew up right in the middle of Portland, not in a suburb in Portland proper. I am a product of Portland Public Schools. Okay. And I actually never knew that about you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, there's a lot of pain for me whenever I return to the city mm -hmm. because of uh, how I've been treated here. Uh, I would say I'm persona non grata in the city and even um, the local press does, because of how biased some of the publications are and some of the writers that, particularly at Portland Mercury and some of the writers at Willamette Week, uh, have really sought to misinform the public about who I am, lie about who I am, and pr portray me as some type of like far right extremist. And um, those lies unfortunately radicalize people until not just disliking my writings but uh, having a violent hatred in me and i've been beaten several times some of those instances people are aware of because there were videos and photos that went viral particularly in 2019 when after people after antifa mob beat me uh, in the face and head punches and bashed me with whatever tools they had. Um, then they threw all their milkshakes on me uh, to blind me so that I couldn't see even where to get out f for help. That was in the middle of downtown in front of the Justice Center. There's been a lot of violence in front of the Multnomah Justice Center over the last um, five years. Um, in 2021, I was beaten uh, on the streets of downtown again while trying to do coverage undercover. So. Um, yeah, that is, it is really interesting that you, I don't know, bring that up because I was going to mention like 
um, there's it seems to be like you mentioned, I guess the, from the press, but also just people to the left here in Portland, this idea that you uh, and I wholeheartedly reject this that you somehow don't know anything about Portland and that you're you know writing from somewhere far away. And I can I've known you for several years now, and I can totally say that that's bullshit. <laughs> um, you know more than a lot of people in the press here locally, in my opinion, um, and are a better journalist. Um, but I just wanted to say that because, yeah, like, I don't know, you're le a legit journalist here, and um, I appreciate the work you do, um, despite the shade that you get. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, let's back up a little bit. I wanted to – tell me about – because obviously you were saying you went to Portland Public School here, and then you just kind of jumped to PSU from there. No, I went to UCLA for my undergrad. Okay. Um UCLA has been in the news again, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, not for good reason, uh, because that was where one of the largest and most violent gas encampments took place. Uh, that was my undergrad. And then for my graduate studies, I went to Portland State, which also had a violent encampment in a besieging of the Miller Library, which is the biggest library on campus, uh, and the rioters destroyed that library. So... Uh, did you, I'm just curious, when you were there, did you, because I, I talked to the, um, Michael, the professor I know there, but did you use that library like when you were there? That's the main library, right? Now. I did. That's where everybody went to to study. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to recap what happened earlier uh, this month in, in May, across the U.S., there were encampments that were set up at dozens of universities. Uh, it started at Columbia. There were professional rioters and agitators behind the organizing that worked with student activist groups, particularly um, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine was one of the main groups and others as well. Uh, a coalition of far left extremists, communists, um, revolutionary communists and Palestinian ethno-nationalists and also Muslim extremists coming together to use the campus space as um, their playing field to carry out their acts of public intimidation against other students, against faculty, against administrators, and Unfortunately, um, these encampments were set up uh, far beyond Colombia, spread not just across the U.S., but into Canada as well and into parts of Europe. And in Portland, it didn't get a lot of national media attention because there was so much focus on UCLA and Colombia and, and CUNY. Uh, but at, at Portland State, for four and a half days, Far left extremists, including Antifa, were able to besiege the the library and take take it over and destroy it uh, floor by floor. Miller Library is a six level building. It's very big. It has lots of valuable rare books in its collection. And those who were occupying the library, they renamed it to a a name of a Palestinian pers uh, person who had died. Uh, they promised that they wouldn't. Uh, damaged the books, but they did. Um, and they also destroyed computer equipment. They destroyed the fire extinguisher system so that they could smoke and set things on fire on the inside. They had, and these are pictures you can see from Portland police when they went in, they had this whole cache of weapons that they were prepared to use, like metal ball bearings, which during 2020, they would fire these metal ball bearings with slingshots mm -hmm at the faces of police hoping to blind them. And I didn't it, it's the photos I saw it was like use this if police come or something like that. Correct. Yeah. They poured um soap and chemicals all over the ground so that people would slip. Uh they barricaded the inside with all of this um furniture. The library was destroyed. The and it was destroyed with in my view the blessing of the Portland State president and mm -hmm. could she allowed the encampment to happen when it was first outside the library people they were already blocking part of the entrance for several days which she allowed and then once they had enough agitators come in non-students mostly 
then they just stormed the library and took it over. And she also kind of um, caved to their demands in her letter, I believe, uh, which they didn't accept. I don't think. Yeah, that. I mean, she said she was willing to not pursue any um, uh, pursue any uh, restitution through the criminal justice system, for example, as part of the negotiations that they wouldn't accept grants and scholarship money from Boeing. And of, of course, it's never enough. Uh, there's a reason why people say don't negotiate with terrorists. Mm -hmm. These are people, if, as part of the vandalism inside Portland State Library, and this is also at, at UW in Seattle, University of Washington, their Which encampment is still ongoing. Still going, right, yeah. If you look at the messages that they write, this is violent extremist sentiment, really extreme stuff, and it's being obfuscated by the media. They won't highlight it or show the pictures of the graffiti messages. That Portland State, inside the library, the extremists wrote, um, kill your local congressman, uh, F, F your vote, take direct action. At University of Washington in Seattle, um, the people at the encampment wrote in large graffiti in, at their on campus, kill your colonizer. And then it had the upside down red triangle, which Hamas used uh, as their targets on the kibbutzes mm. on the 7th of October. Uh, the texts in, in zines, as they call them, these pamphlets that are distributed inside their encampments. This is also something that happened in 2020 at the riots because they don't go, Antifa don't just go straight to rioting. They first meet up often um, at a nearby park and they'll give out um, the pamphlets, um, they'll do some militancy training, and they'll give out shields and various weapons they'll distribute as well. Well, at the library, the, the zines made a appearance again, and these are booklets uh, that have appeared at all the encampments recently for Gaza. Is it kind of a way for them to distribute information offline? Is that the idea? It's more so a way to radicalize people who show up to the encampments okay. because people who come may be sympathetic to the cause but they're not necessarily radicalized yet mm -hmm. so then these texts which are available through usually anarchist blogs online that people can print out at home for example it'll, pro it'll provide the ideological justification for terrorism or provide um, tactics on how to besiege buildings how to break um through break the locks, for example, what tools to take, um, the best ways to make Molotov cocktails and other homemade explosive and fire devices as well. So these are really extreme texts. Um, and actually at the University of California, Irvine, at their encampment uh, uh, earlier this week, one of the texts that was discovered at their zine um, table was a printout of literally Hamas media office propaganda. Mm -hmm. So Hamas, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, have their own media offices where they make their own propaganda that they distribute online in different languages, Arabic, obviously, but also English as well. And they had an English language um, official Hamas propaganda at this camp. So we're not dealing with um pro-palestine protesters which is how legacy media describes them these are inaccurate euphemisms you're dealing with violent extremists who espouse an ideology that explicitly supports terrorism and the reason why the far left is supportive of the 7th of October terrorist attacks in Israel by Hamas is because they view that as an act of decolonization. Mm -hmm. Immediately after uh, the atrocities were being reported, what academics and leftist ideologues were saying is that this is decolonization in action. And decolonization is not just a theory, it's action that you take. And they celebrated it. And these are people who would like to see similar acts of terrorism like that happen in the United States against people and institutions they view as colonizers. Because it's justified in that sense to them, yeah. Correct. 
Yeah, and it's still, I mean, you probably know much better than me, like, obviously the UW one's still going, but there's got to be other more um, ongoing encampments besides that one. I know a lot of them have been kind of shut down, but... Um, at University of Chicago, one of the campus buildings uh, yesterday was taken over. It remains occupied today. Okay. So it's it's like even when police clear out an encampment, some number of days pass or a week passes, and the militants regroup and they take another building or build another encampment. Mm -hmm. And over and over, we're seeing weak leadership from university presidents. Unsurprisingly, these are all institutions that administratively have been captured by left-wing ideologues who push critical race theory, DEI, and other types of grievance ideologies. And so they're willing to negotiate with these violent extremists. The University of Washington president uh, just sent a letter uh, earlier today to the faculty and students saying that they have that she's negotiated with the encamp encampment occupiers and that they've agreed to a number of demands and in turn she's asked that they leave the encampment by uh monday uh, that's a few days from now and part of the concessions that the university of washington has agreed to according to this letter is that they're not going to pursue uh um legal action against those who are part of the encampment so giving blanket amnesty to those involved in criminal trespass the the university will spend more resources on fighting islamophobia mm. so there's no islamophobia happening in any of these universities what we're seeing is judeophobia people who at Reed College, for yeah, I was example, say, we just had this, yeah, Reed, a very horrific incident that's been emitted by the administrators at Reed. Reed is this very, very expensive private liberal arts college in Southeast Portland. It's small, it's very prestigious, it's extremely expensive, and it's very far left. And the, a Jewish student, female student there had a rock thrown through her dorm window that hit her during a night of protesting by an event organized by Students for Justice in Palestine. And she had a, uh, a Jewish symbol on her dormitory door. Uh, it's a scroll with um, Hebrew text from the Hebrew Bible, and that was ripped off and destroyed. And, and I believe she ended up just leaving campus is what i read but oh, okay i didn't see that she, part i mean after that i don't see why she would stick around but yeah. so th that's one anecdote but over and over we're, we're seeing jewish students and israeli american students at universities across america expressing how they've been subjected to violence harassment intimidation at their university campuses and at, at some places there are um class action lawsuits now. Yeah. There are those who are suing Columbia University, for example, for allowing this enca an encampment to go on for days and days where students who are paying very high fees are not able to access buildings um, that they need to, and they're not able to walk through parts of campus. Mm -hmm. Safely, yeah. Yeah, it's totally, you know, I, I listened to a lot of congressional hearings and they were I think it was the secret or the education secretary was on there recently, but they were asking him because these are all to me clear. I believe it's Title VI violations. Um, you're discriminating based on uh, national origin or religion, which or both in this case. But but yeah, I just I hope there's more pressure and scrutiny on these universities because it's just it's still ongoing. I had a guy in here last week who was saying he hoped he could walk to get his degree because they've been going after graduation ceremonies now and trying to shut those down. Uh, the protesters have, the uh, rioters have. Um, so yeah, it seems like it's going to kind of, at least to me, like bleed into <laughs> the November riots that we may see. But um, it's a it's a wild time. I'm glad you're staying on top of it because like you're like the extremist kind of, <laughs> I look to you for information on extremists all over. Um, uh, but yeah. I'm curious, let me go back to Antifa for a second. I want you to do your best job because I still hear this from young people of like, it means anti-fascist. That's a good thing. Like, what do you, 
What's your response to people like that? That I try to tell them it's part of the deception of the name, like that's built into it. Um, but like, what do you tell people that still have that belief? So part of the propaganda and the branding of Antifa is they said it, that it just simply means anti-fascist and that any person who's against fascism is part of Antifa. That is a deception. Antifa is short for anti-fascist, but it's what matters is who they accuse of being a fascist. It's one thing if they, they as a movement were very disciplined and applied uh, the label fascist to people who actually espouse or organize under fascist ideology, but that's not what they do. They go after not just people on the mainstream right, they go after people who violate various leftist ideologies, such as left-wing people who are critical of transgender ideology, for example. They've attacked women, feminists, who protest against the erasure of biological reality when it comes to human sex. Um, Antifa go after journalists mm -hmm. attack videographers writers photographers who are documenting public demonstrations and activities and are engaging in their first amendment rights they violate the civil rights of other people with impunity quite often so what they call themselves is to me irrelevant mm -hmm. i try to focus on their activities i don't give them the propaganda win of calling them anti-fascist i call them antifa because it's that is different than being against fa fascism and people should be aware of when they're being misled about what this movement is it is a movement made up of anarchists and communists who explicitly reject liberal values and by liberal i'm referring to individual rights freedom of speech mm -hmm the rule of law, what they believe in is we will take direct action and collective action to shut down our opponents by any means necessary. So explicitly they use violence, injuring people, maiming people, harassing people, releasing, uh, doxing is a big thing. And by doxing, I'm not talking about naming somebody who's been in a photograph, whatever. I do that in my reporting, identify um, extremists who are part of Antifa and in public and I can recognize who they are or I look into their criminal histories what they've been arrested post that information that's that's not doxing I'm referring to doxing as in releasing for example addresses mm -hmm. of where people live at their family homes releasing pictures of their children the names of their children or their spouse these are acts that are meant to terrorize people at their family homes that's what they do they do all of that and I know people here that as well that they'll find their license plate and track their vehicles and stuff like that. I don't know. Correct. They yeah. do. They do things. Uh, also, uh, yes, like um, not just posting pictures of somebody's house, but posting posting pictures of their car, mm -hmm. um, where they work as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. ad addresses of where they can be found at a particular uh, business, so that people go. This is the stochastic terrorism that they always accuse the right of. Like they put out all this personal private information so that one of their comrades takes action at their home at the home of the the victim that they're trying to target so um and in addition to all the things i just said that are part of their tactics they're also willing to kill and they praise people who engage in homicidal violence so in in august of 2020 weeks and weeks after the riots had started and was still ongoing in downtown Portland, you had a self-described um, Antifa member who shot dead a Trump supporter at a riot in downtown. And that he, he fled out of state, and this is Michael Rhino, and he was ultimately killed uh, near Olympia, Washington by a U.S. Um, federal task force. In a, in a shootout, he was armed. Now, Michael Reino has been eulogized as a martyr and a hero for what he did by Antifa. And he's, he's just one of many who um, 
engage in murderous violence um, who are then treated as heroes that others should emulate. Mm. So this is all, this is a lot of information and to the average person, um, it's overwhelming. They wouldn't, and also because of information bubbles, they're not going to be aware of it. And it, it's one thing I really lament. I think one of the reasons that um, my detractors in the mainstream left work so hard to try to force me out of the mainstream left, make it so that, for example, liberal media won't platform me or something, is that they don't want the truth about the violent far left out there. Mm -hmm. And so for even the average decent person, if they watch NBC or CNN, um, they're not going to be informed accurately about the threat of far left violence in America. Think back to 2020, how when we had months of deadly, deadly rioting after George Floyd died, how it was literally being described in legacy media is that these were racial justice protests. Mm -hmm. These were fiery but peaceful protests. Mostly peaceful. Mostly peaceful. They, these, and they they believed it. They they came up with this perception that it was um, really isolated incidences and was rare when there was some violence, even though there were more than two dozen people who died mm -hmm. violently as a result of these riots, in addition to the billions of dollars in economic damage. I mean, neighborhoods are burnt down in Minneapolis, for example. Yeah. And I would say Portland's downtown still hasn't recovered from that, you know. I mean, it was 120 whatever days of... More than 120 nights of um, rioting night after night after night. And this, just sorry to interrupt, but it, it drives me crazy up here because I still know people my age and younger that seem to think that there's these boogeyman right-wing groups that are just terrorizing Portland. And I try to tell them, you don't remember... You know, 120 days of left wing like activity is a whole year. <laughs> of, um, so I I don't know. I just try to explain it to people, but there's such a blue bubble here. It's hard to break through that. But it's actually really now that I've I've, I've left Portland and left the U.S. It's really it's really disturbing to me how people could be so disinformed yeah. in places like Portland. They've twisted it in their mind to like I don't know. I guess when I was here, I didn't maybe realize how bad it was because I was, this is all I knew. This is where I was from and where I was living. Um, I In 2018, for example, I reported on this um, gay hate crime panic that happened in Portland. Mm -hmm. And this is so emblematic of Portland and, and unfortunately many other cities in America, there were viral claims on social media that LGBTQ plus people were being targeted by roving groups of white supremacists, that a number of them have been killed and none of them were almost killed and survived. And it created a huge panic. And I looked into it. I was like, okay, first of all, who died? Like it's, it's, pretty easy to confirm somebody mm -hmm. uh, if there's been a homicide. One, nobody died. Uh, two, the claims of some of these unverified stories about people being beaten by white supremacists and Proud Boys was completely unsubstantiated. For example, there was one by this trans activist who did a big GoFundMe. This was one of the uh, stories that helped fuel the panic. And in the GoFundMe, this trans activists made allegations that um, that he had been uh, beaten with a bat, unconscious, uh, just for being trans in Portland. And when you look at the police report, it strongly suggests that this person had actually passed out drunk. Hmm. I mean, they were walking around in a part of Portland with a gun in their bag. Um, and when police returned to the scene where this person passed out, the 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 gun was still on the ground when this person passed out it doesn't you would think that if somebody had targeted them in an attack that they would take the weapon um but this person raised a lot of money on gofundme thousands and thousands was this the one that got the mercury picked up yes yeah yeah they reported on yeah they did several stories on it uh ted wheeler had to speak out about uh the panic uh promising the community that 
the city would do everything to pr protect them. The Queer Center, which is an activist organization in Portland, hosted like a big town hall. And there was no substantiation to any of these stories. And I, I, that, I did that piece for the New York Post Sunday edition. I remember that was the first time like I really earned the ire of fellow Portlanders because it was like, how dare you question this claim? And, you know, I'm a I'm a gay man. I I what angers me more than anything is when people who are part of my community embellish and or make up stories about being victims to benefit themselves, usually through mm -hmm. fundraising campaigns. We see this over and over at university campuses. Hate hoaxes are a very common issue, unfortunately, at university campuses. But in Portland, the whole city, unfortunately, is a bit nuts. Yeah. Well, there's just no scrutiny like that. I'm glad that- Nobody you... dares to scrutinize. Yeah. You'll I'm... get destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad that you covered, because I do remember that you had a whole kind of period where you did covered all these hate hoaxes. Um, and in my head, that's the role of what journalism should be doing. So I'm glad you're doing it or we're doing it and continue to do it. Um, my entire journalism career has been being a thorn in leftist orthodoxy. Yeah. I wrote about, reported a lot about hate crime hoaxes before I started reporting about Antifa. Mm -hmm. And I, before I used to write about radical Islam as well and um, Muslim extremism. So uh, I've always, in my view, punched up a uh, challenge. Um, Truth of Cla power and all that. Claims that uh, we're told we, we, we cannot question. Mm -hmm. Tell me, about, I'm curious, yeah, was that, what were you writing about at the PSU paper? Were, did, were they, did they kind of draw that ire after a while? Because... So I was at the Portland State newspaper for over a year as a multimedia editor. I covered many of the... Um, anti-Trump protests and riots that happened after November 2016. I did video and I did writing. I wrote a, I covered an event. This wasn't for Portland State Vanguard. It wasn't for the student newspaper. It was for my Twitter at the time, which had a very small following. But sometimes I posted tweets and videos and photos of events that I went to on there. And there was an interfaith event on campus of students um, representing different faiths and talking about um, their religion. And there was a moment where a Muslim student had been asked about apostasy, and he expressed that in Islam um, apostasy wasn't allowed and suggested heavily that those who leave the Islamic faith um, are subjected to death Wow! as a matter of of Islamic law. And I recorded that on my iPhone 7, I think it was at the time, and I posted it on my Twitter. It went a little viral. I think I only had a few hundred retweets, for, but for that time, for my account, that was a lot. And I was hauled until an administrative meeting uh, for Portland State Media, and the editor-in-chief was there, and they fired me based on that um, tweet. They talked about Islamophobia. They talked about the diversity and inclusion training that I had been part of as part of student media that I should have uh, anticipated how it would be perceived and that there were many comments on social media that were Islamophobic and they were blaming me for it. So uh, I wrote about that experience at the time uh, for the National Review, and that was my first time writing for a national publication. I'm still to today always thankful that the National Review gave this no-name person named Andy Ngo, who nobody knew, an opportunity to write a piece for them that was published. And that was the start of sort of my um, the public career. Mm -hmm. That piece was quite well received from the National Review, and I had a lot of support. And um, it told me uh, what I learned from that is that I can continue in journalism because I, when I was publicly fired from the student uh, student newspaper, 
I felt so demoralized. I thought I can never work in media again. How could I when anytime somebody Googles me, they're going to see this article at the Portland State Vanguard where they um, completely uh, lied about the circumstances of what happened and and um, threw me under the bus in a very disgusting way, uh, one of their former colleagues. Um, but I was able to overcome it and ultimately write a book uh, that came out in 2021, Unmasked. Um, it was New York Times bestseller. Um, you can still not find this book in Pals. Pals is right. the the uh, Bandit or whatever. Yeah. Is the uh, largest bookstore uh, in Portland, and I think one of the largest independent bookstores in the world. There were violent protests um, just before this book came out in January 2021 at the. Pal's um, main location in downtown on Burnside. And so Pal's just acquiesced and said, okay, we won't sell this book by a Portland author uh, in any of our stores. And, um, you know, it was completely sidelined by um, local media here. And the only review of it was in LA Times by a leftist writer who wrote a very nasty review. I can tell he didn't read the book. I tell I can tell that he skimmed through a few chapters, look, and he misquoted parts of it as well. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's a great book. Yeah, I I I remember when that happened because I sent them a um, a stupid DM. I was just angry, and I sent Powell's a DM about it. Like, how can you ban a local author? <laughs> but it's just you see that irony a lot these days. I hear people complaining about Florida banning books and. I see the real banning happening more on that side of things. The irony of Pals is that every year they dedicate a whole week to what they say are banned books, which are actually books that in various part of, parts of the world have been banned by different government regimes or their off, the authors have been subjected to violent persecution for their writings. It's It's really sad that for a bookstore that for years has championed um, freedom of expression, particularly to, for authors, would give in to political threats in Portland. Um, and just in a capitalist way. I know they're not probably pro super pro-capitalist, but wouldn't they want to make more money off any book? I don't get that, but whatever. I haven't, I haven't shopped there since then. But um. Bookstores are uh, one of the industries that have been captured by... Yeah leftist ideologues in addition to libraries if you look at for example the current president of the uh, american library association which is the the biggest organization that represents um libraries and librarians in the u.s uh the president there currently is a open communist revolutionary communist and it's like academe it's like entertainment it's like journalism it's like the music press it's like all these industries have been captured and they've done so much damage you know for me i don't i don't want to see it like i don't want to see all these institutions captured by the right what i would like to see is for them to just be restored back to mm -hmm. their mandate which is you know journalism should be about accuracy and um to re and about removing bias from stories mm -hmm. for example unfortunately we don't see that i mean the yeah. reality of media now is that it, it is partisan you know I, I work for conservative media conservative media is what what platforms me but in my own writings i i make it a very um it's my goal to remove the biases that i can recognize that i have every writer has biases you know people think like unmasked is like some GOP MAGA type book. It's not. I worked very, very hard on making sure that it's presenting people with with uh, the facts and accuracy and accurate analysis that wasn't done through a partisan lens. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking. Um, I you know I agree with you on all that stuff. And one thing that helped kind of make a cohesive picture of that was Douglas Murray's um, War on the West book. Um, because it's just this huge spread of anti-Western values that's, like you said, in entertainment and the press and education. Um, and it's it, it, in the protests, we were just talking about all those protests as well. It's very anti-Western sentiment. Um, 
Yes, there's a lot of self-hatred uh, in America, in various Western countries. Um, a lot of thinkers have uh, offered various um, hypotheses on where this originates from. Uh, I think a lot of it is... Um, Various left-wing ideologues have been able to be very successful at mainstreaming grievance ideology. Mm. And with these institutional captures, particularly in education and academia, they can, they can do historical revisionism, rewrite what American history is, um, rewrite what American philosophy, political philosophy is, misinform the public about our institutions. And now all of it is illegitimate because it's about upholding white supremacist colonial power. Mm -hmm. They use these same accusations against Israel and say Israel should be destroyed for the same reason that America should be destroyed because these are evil white supremacist projects. Colonizers or whatever, yeah. Yeah, and the, that's the danger of these ideologies is that it, the logical conclusion that it leads to is that people end up supporting terrorism and genocide against their enemies yeah they really do and they dehumanize their targets um the violent far left is very very similar to the neo-nazis that they say they oppose actually mm. um i just had a, some like rapid fire questions here um i just wanted to make because you mentioned you know obviously you've been assaulted many times by antifa but nobody's ever been charged with a crime for any of that is that correct that's correct unfortunately it's just it's just sad to me that that I don't know, um, and I wanted to get your take on just break down I guess, as quick as you can the Atlanta Antifa stuff and then also the San Diego stuff because I I just want to give people a sense of like this is a kind of a large network in the U S and they operate in these different territories. Yes, I I I hope that um, listeners and viewers aren't hung up on the name Antifa because a lot of the far left extremists organize under a number of names. A lot of the names are ad hoc names for movements for a particular cause, but are nonetheless part of a larger network. You can just think of them broadly as under the umbrella as far left violent extremism. Some of them organize as communists, um, as socialists, anarchists. Um, Palestinian ultranationalists. So it, there are different political ideologies that are under that umbrella. Um, so don't get too hung up on the name Antifa. I say that just because sometimes the, the word Antifa is missing from some of these um, far left movements that are linked to Antifa, actually, even though they don't have it in the name. So uh, Atlanta, it's part of this movement called Stop Cop City. Um, for the last three years, there have been occupations and violence in a forested area south of Atlanta by far left extremists who have done anything and everything they can to try to stop the construction of a first responder training facility. This is on city property. City council has repeatedly um, gone through the process to prove it and to prove the funding it's happening. And the reason why the far left is, uh, they, call, they call this first responder training facility a uh, cop city. They don't want law enforcement to be better trained. They thrive off incidences of police misconduct or bad police training that leads to some of these viral moments that are caught on video because that gives them an opportunity to organize, recruit, to riot. They need those instances. They don't want police to be better trained. So uh, there have been a number of violent occupations in this wooded area construction equipment set, set on fire, destroyed, firebombed, millions of dollars in damages. Um, residents who live in that area south of Atlanta have been terrorized by these extremists who are connected to Antifa. And two years ago, there was um, at one of the autonomous zone occupations on the site when law enforcement, um, Georgia State Police, Atlanta Police, and other uh, Georgia Bureau investigations, when they came to try to clear out this encampment, there was a gunman in one of the tents who shot um, a, a Georgia state trooper. And then um, the other law enforcement sh shot at the tent and he was killed. And he's become uh, this martyr mm -hmm. for them. And Antifa then in the days after he died, rioted through downtown 
Atlanta, Peachtree Street, Big Street, set um, cars on fire, smash up businesses, like what they've done in downtown Portland many, many times. The Georgia um, State Attorney General last year announced that 61 members of this movement, this far less movement, um, the Stop Cop City movement, had been indicted on RICO, money laundering, and or domestic terrorism charges. And the uh, attorney general in, in Georgia has been under so much attack by left-wing press, saying that they're, he's attacking the freedom of expression. No, these are people who are accused of being part of organized criminal activity and engaging in setting up these different nonprofit groups that are laundering money and buying weapons and ammunition for people who are allegedly involved in these violent encampments and, and riots. So that case is still ongoing right now. Um, one of the people who was indicted in the RICO case was a SPLC staffer, He's still on staff, oh, wow, okay. an attorney yeah. who's accused of being part of a terrorist movement. And if people don't know, yeah, the Southern Poverty Law Center, they're kind of well-known, super left group. Yeah. They say that they're a hate watch group. They're a nonprofit. They have half a billion dollars in endowment that they put in um, offshore places. Um, they became really well enriched after Trump was elected. They really peddled these lies about surges of hate crimes in America. And people foolishly, foolishly donated so much money to them. And so they... That group, in my view, SPLC, is sympathetic to far left extre violent extremism, mm -hmm. because I, after their staffer was indicted, um, I contacted their communications office and asked them repeatedly if the organization rejects the use of political violence, and they would not reject it. Wow! In their responding correspondence, that says a lot. Um, and this is one of the head hate watch groups that many legacy media organizations cite as somehow credible mm -hmm. um i'd guess also like education as well kind of t looks to them a lot of the time unfortunately yeah unfortunately we really have we have wolves um in gar uh, guarding basically hen houses like hen houses being american society you have these dangerous figures leading various nonprofit groups um, who are causing so much damage mm -hmm. to this country. And they're, yeah. Um, regarding uh, San Diego, I well, can... Before you, yeah. I was just going to mention, I think it's it was important to me when I was learning about Atlanta too, that it's like, I think you mentioned it's a wooded area, but like these were kind of around the training facility, like they set up like camps in the trees kind of thing, right? <laughs> Wasn't it? They did that. They, they created like this large autonomous zone yeah. most of the people by the way who were indicted overwhelmingly are not from the state of georgia right they're from all over the united states some of them are from different countries there was a person from france who was indicted there was a person from um several people from canada uh, by the way the person from france has fled back to france so it was like this call to like come here and you know, yes and even in portland there there was a portland person who was who was allegedly involved in one of the Stop Cop City riots and was charged with domestic terrorism. Um, but there have been all these attacks across the U.S., um, isolated attacks by people who say they do it uh, in support of Stop Cop City, in solidarity with. So there are these various anarchist far-left blogs that will publish claims or responsibilities that they get from their members. Um, scenes from the Atlanta Forest is one of the extremist blogs, and if you go in there, there's really extreme stuff on there. And they post, for example, the um, home addresses in pictures of Atlanta police officers, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. uh, post uh, the home addresses and phone numbers of some of the judges that have been involved in overseeing some of the, the cases of the people who have been charged. Um, so there, there have been attacks in Portland that have been claimed in solidarity with Stop Cop City. The encampment that happened at Portland State just recently, um, people wrote in the graffiti messages, in, in addition to kill your local congressman, they also wrote Stop Cop City, which wow. is one of the slogans for that movement. It really is unifying. Too. I wanted to point out earlier, because I've mentioned this on other shows, that 
I know at least one or two of those people in the PSU occupation were <laughs> the same people from 2020, the same. More you know, than one or yeah. two. Lots. And they were mostly not students. Yeah. So uh, on the 2nd of May is when police finally responded. They made 30 arrests throughout the day because in addition to the encampment, there were rioters outside. Police arrested 30 people. Out of that, only six have any affiliation with PSU. So overwhelmingly, it's it's, it's not involving students. Stud there's a small group of radical student extremists who are working hand in hand with outside agitators, some of them who were involved in the 2020 riots. Um, it's just incredible to me that these people just have free reign and they still can't. Well, it goes back to, to Mike Schmidt and the Multnomah County DA's office. They've created a, a revolving door. Mm -hmm. You create a culture where people can commit acts of political violence, leftist political violence with impunity. They'll continue doing it. And the DA's office will continue, continue to not pursue those charges um, or the cases get dismissed by a biased judge. That happens too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. So quickly, what, um, break down the San Diego stuff. Cause I have no idea what's going on there really. I spent three years reporting on a felony conspiracy case, uh, out of San Diego County. So in 2021, SoCal Antifa, which is a, it's like a, a cluster group for several regional Antifa groups in Southern California. So mm -hmm. there's there's Antifa in Los Angeles, in Long Beach, in San Diego. SoCal Antifax sort of as like a parent group to these smaller cells. Okay. Members of that went to San Diego to Pacific Beach, which is, which is in San Diego, and attacked, brutally attacked Trump supporters in January 2021. In fact, they were so overzealous with their violence that they attacked regular people who were just walking by on the beach, including a service dog in his walker. Um, and so in San Diego County, they have a very good prosecutor named Summer Stevens. She actually, um, uh, a year or two before the riot, when she she ran and beat against the Soros-funded candidate mm -hmm. in San Diego County, by the way. And San Diego pursued felony conspiracy charges in addition to felony assault charges against these people. The conspiracy part was the first time anywhere in America prosecutors had alleged that there was an organized element to this rioting. For example, in Portland, C uh, Seattle, all these places where there's been antifa violence, where people have been convicted through these sweetheart plea deals, the prosecutors have only gone after the the um, the act of violence, for example, oh, the charge will only be arson or or um, assault. Oregon does have a, a RICO statute, a racketeering statute. Um, and a similar charge, I guess, in California would be the conspiracy charge. And the prosecutors um, charged 12 people and 12 for 12 now. It went to trial finally. Um, a week and a half ago, wow. and now the uh, two people were at the the trial. Ten others beforehand had already pleaded guilty okay. to felonies. Okay, and those who had been sentenced so far, there were three who had been sentenced. They're sentenced to years in prison. Wow. So this DA's office is not playing around. It's they're not giving these sweetheart plea deals where somebody just gets probation. No, you do felony conspiracy, you do felony assault, you're doing prison time. And 12 for 12 of these members of SoCal Antifa have been convicted of various felonies. And most of them will be sentenced um, next month. So um, my colleague, Abe Benant, was in the trial. It was uh, a month-long trial. Was so much evidence. Yeah, I think I sort of know her. I mean, I followed her on Twitter. She she does yeah. great reporting. Yeah. I did uh, several stories with her. Didn't, and Didn't they start coming at her, um, of course? Correct. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, this was ignored by national media, even by national conservative media. There's just there's a lot going on right now in the news space, obviously, with Trump in his criminal trial in Manhattan. So they didn't focus on the San Diego case. It was seen as too local. That's a mistake. This case, the evidence in it, for example, through the weeks of trial, you could see how pros prosecutors got the signal messages many of them deleted wow and you could see that who was involved in this group who tra who traveled together 
Um, they boasted about the violence after the riot. Um, they admitted to using various weapons. All this photo and video evidence as well. And the prosecutors and the investigators were so good at unmasking each one because they were they were in black block. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And so it sort of cemented that connection of like, yeah, this is a coordinated group. organized planned violence in violating the civil rights of other people. You know, people might not left wing people might not like that Trump supporters can organize or that MAGA people can have a rally. But they have a right to it, just like these people have a right to organize their left wing protests or whatever. Um, unfortunately, since I would say since 2016, there's been this mainstreaming of this belief that you don't like what somebody has to say or what they organize about, that you have a right to shut them down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it started on the university campuses going back a decade ago, around 2015, these instances of campus crazies. Um, shutting down events on campuses, and that was encouraged. And these people then went on to be in he human resource offices, to work at organizations, to work in governments, um, and helping in work in media, and helping to normalize this environment where people on the left feel that they can engage in silencing other citizens. Mm -hmm. And very few prosecutors would hold the violent ones to account. In San Diego, they did. And the SoCal Antifa cell has been shut down. I mean, they, they took down all their social media accounts. Wow. Um, That's what I was going to ask is that it, it's really disrupted their whole operation down there. Yeah. Correct. And I hope San Diego is a blueprint for other prosecutors. Um, the, the case in Atlanta State is a big deal because using RICO, that's the first time it's been used against in recent years against um, organized leftist violence. That is pretty incredible, yeah. Because I've, I've never heard of success like that in, in a court. Um, but that's great to hear. I mean, yeah, like, like you said, uh, hopefully that's a blueprint for other uh, territories to facing the same stuff. Um, the only other thing I was going to ask before I get into these goofy questions was, and we, we kind of touched on this a lot, but um, I just wanted to ask you, I ask a lot of people on this show about and like 100% of them think that there <laughs> there will be riots in November, but like, what do you see happening this November in Portland? We're in a really different political climate this in 2024 than 2020. I do think that massive anti-Trump rally organizing is going to have less salience to the public. The public has already experienced a Trump administration for four years. They saw that he wasn't this Hitler figure that did mass deportations and, and death camps and all these other things that were part of the hysteria. So even though obviously there will be some anti-Trump protests that would organize a Trump word to win, they're not going to be in the scale that we saw in my in my prediction. However, um, I think that there will be some rioting by Antifa. There was a Trump win. They'll, they'll use the opportunity to go out and smash windows, in fact, and, and start fires. I mean, they did that even after there was a Biden win mm -hmm. in Portland in 2020. Granted, they weren't able to do nights of election-related riots. Um, they would have gotten that if Trump had won in, in 2020. I think right now... <laughs> There's a lot of focus on the 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 war in the Middle East involving Israel and Hamas. It's taken away some of the breath, I think, from some of the domestic issues. Um, yeah. That's, so, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess you know I'm I'm never too good at predicting. Anyways, I <laughs> no, I, I I come in and do the um, the analysis and yeah. the reporting after things have happened or as they are happening. Antifa are going to find any reason to riot, mm -hmm. particularly in Portland, where they have um, a lot of um, organized structure to it. And in fact, they played a big role in the recent encampment at PSU, and it showed that they, they were able to reactivate very, very quickly. And I mean, within a period of less than 24 hours, um, 
from the 1st of May to 2nd of May, they were able to not just be a part of the PSU encampment, but also lead May Day events and then to riot through downtown. The Apple Store was attacked. The Starbucks at Pioneer Courthouse Square, which has been attacked repeatedly in the past, was smashed up again. And some of the messages that the rioters wrote, uh, instead of F Trump, they wrote Free Gaza this time. So we have... Or gang, violent gangs in Portland that can activate on a whim, unfortunately, and uh, I blame the DA a lot for that because their members were able to get away with so much violence before, I, and there was no effort by prosecutors to actually go after the organized criminality. Uh, we'll see if the new if there's a new prosecutor who's not Schmidt, if things will change. Yeah, um, that's what I was just thinking. It's gonna so much of that will be determined by the new DA and stuff. Unfortunately, there's a lot of political pressure as well to not go, um, to not prosecute violent leftists mm -hmm. in, in Monoma County. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you for the most part. And I, you know, I, I, it's one of the reasons I think stuff will happen either way is because I see this, you know, like you said, I saw the DNC headquarters destroyed last time Biden won. And if he wins again, now I see this building anti-biden stuff because of the war because they're anti-israel whatever you want to call it um so it just seems like either way there's they're, like you said they're going to have a cause to to react to um but yeah um is there anything else you want to say before i get in these goofy questions these are just quick dumb questions <laughs> Let's get into the goofy questions. Okay, do, right. do we? This has been kind of a depressing topic, so maybe we do need comic relief. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, all right. Let's say you're parking in a normal spot, kind of like you did here. Do you pull in or do you back in? I saw what you did out here, but is there like a one preferred way when you drive? Do you park? Do you back in or do you pull in? I normally pull in just because it's easier, um, but I... I hope one day I can get a a, a nice uh, new car that has like auto parking the features, sensors, and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, which piece of fruit do you think you could throw the farthest if you just chucked a piece of fruit across like a soccer field or football field? What a bizarre and particular question. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it reviews something about your mind. I don't even know the answer. That's the dumb thing. Is I assume an orange because it's a sphere, and okay. I assume it can um, have the least resistance through the wind. But with me throwing it, it doesn't really matter what the fr the the fruit is. It's not going to go very far. I'm terrible at sports. That's okay. Um, I like that. I don't get orange a lot. Most people say like apple or um, other things, but I like that. Um, do you like crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Maybe you don't like peanut butter. I like crunchy. I, I I like that there's that texture in it. Um, I live in England now, and uh, the British do find the American taste palette quite um, particular and interesting. Um, odd, really. Uh, Americans do things like put a lot of put peanut butter in a lot of things mm -hmm. that you wouldn't. I mean, there's peanut butter burgers now. Correct. There's yeah. peanut bur peanut butter burgers and. Cereal, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, I I find these things that are Americana um, endearing in a way, and um, I I like the variety that we have in peanut butter in America. There's so many brands and textures. Um, in Europe, you'll be lucky if you can find peanut butter. In in England, you can find peanut butter now, but um, often I think usually it's like smooth. Okay. Do you like stir no stir? Do they even have that over there? I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think they have that choice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with you. I like crunchy no stir. That's my, that's what I like. Um, you just remind me though, I was going to ask you, because when I've been to Europe a few times, I always love those lion bars. Do they still have those? I'm guessing they have those. Do you know what I'm talking about? What's a lion bar? It's just like a Nestle, like, um, it's almost like a Twix. Kind of oh, like okay. You know, I haven't had it, but I, I, I don't eat a lot of um, chocolates and sweets. Yeah. But I hear that. Um, so Cadbury is the the popular um, uh, chocolate brand in the United Kingdom, and for people 
I hear this from both American and British when they compare it to example like Hershey's, just Cadbury is a lot uh, better taste mm-hmm. and quality. I think um I mean Americans are so great with inventing things. I I I saw I think at Costco somewhere there was like shelf stable individually wrapped bacon. Um but I find that Americans don't really prioritize quality and taste quite often. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it's part of our culture, you know. We invented fast food. It's things are about convenience and accessibility. Uh, I. <laughs> it's like health is an afterthought. Health and taste is an afterthought. <laughs> um, I I enjoy traveling to France, for example. Um, it's a it's a quick train ride, obviously from London. And the French really prioritize taste and quality, and it's it's amazing. Um, and it, I'm glad that that world does open up to me. Um, yeah, one of my criticisms of America, I would say, is uh, um, it's processed foods. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I heard a lot from people that like spend a lot of time in Europe is that they have these laws that ban a lot of these processed. Stuff. I don't know if that's true, but. I would believe it. If There's a lot of regulation <laughs> of, um, of food and everything, Ingredients. particularly in the EU. Yeah. So there are some things that are uh, the the product recipe will be different for the European market because certain things are not allowed that are allowed by the FDA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite type of French fry? Do you like straight crinkle waffle fry? Maybe you don't like French fries. Don't I'm actually so glad you asked. Um, so I grew up really liking McDonald's fries. Mm-hmm. I would say out of the fast food, McDonald's fries is very good. However, in Britain, the traditional chip oh, is yeah. what they call it, um, as in like fish and chips, the thick cut, what what we think of, I guess, as steak fries. The traditional British way at like a local pub would be the thick cut, triple fried. Triple and, fried. Correct. Yeah. And battered with beef drippings. That sounds delicious. So it, it, yeah. it elevates the fried potato experience to something quite incredible, I think. I think Britain gets an unfair reputation in its food. People say it is bland or whatever. I would say actually a lot of the traditional stuff is very delicious, particularly around Sunday roast related foods. Mm. Um, and the example I just brought up with the, the, the chip, when it's triple fried, it's like... Um, it makes the exterior really crunchy. Mm. So you develop quite a, a thick crunch to it. It's not a crisp, it's more of a crunch. And then obviously with the beef drippings, it adds this layer of flavor to it. And in fact, McDonald's used to use beef fat flavoring in its fries decades ago mm. until they were sued by vegetarians and they've had to change their recipe. That's a good, I, no one's ever answered the chip though. I, I did have uh, a woman a couple weeks ago who said like the co- like coast uh, fries, which are basically like fish and chips, I think. But you're the first one that's answered chips, which I like. And that is a British... I always tell people when they knock on British food, I'm like, what about fish and chips? That's like one of the best dishes out there. Um, uh, do you... Let's say you're getting ice cream. Do you have a... Do you go waffle cone, regular cone, cup? Or maybe... Cup, I feel... Okay, so ice cream is... I, <laughs> yeah, so you, you, I, I can binge eat quite easily, so okay. ice cream is a treat. I feel like one is wasting the calories when they get like a big cone and everything mm-hmm. might as well get additional ice cream instead of like all this extra sugar in the cone. So I like it in a cup actually, because the highlight of the ice cream to me should be the ice cream. Yeah. I mean, obviously some places do really good in-house um, waffle cones that they make themselves, but most, most places they just buy a commercial brand. So it's like, I feel it doesn't add to the ice cream experience that much. Um, I like. I would rather get two scoops of ice cream. Yeah, I like the cup too. What are you putting in there? What's your? You have like a go-to flavor. I um. So when it comes to junk food, (laughs) I I like it to be actually quite artisan because it's like it's a treat. Um, sweets and and fried foods and stuff. It really it's meant to be a treat, and I think um people who eat it so regularly settle for really low quality low taste stuff i view that if you're going to eat that stuff you know make it one is you don't get it that often so get like really good quality stuff so for me i like the artisanal flavors of ice cream um 
once upon a time, I used to be a big fan of salt and straw, for example. I really yeah. like that the um, dessert chefs they were able to come come up with really unique new combinations of ice cream flavors that one that you wouldn't think would go together but nonetheless are quite nice um unfortunately i i don't i know they're um, they're, pretty, they're like very woke i think but um yes the, and, and now they have kind of gross i don't know they do like gross flavors for fun i think just like uh -huh. bring people in i don't know i've heard a well lot. yeah i i don't support salt and straw anymore just uh because its uh owner is uh was very part of the defund the police mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. and I think those businesses um, are not deserving of the citizens they serve. And like, who's, I don't know. I'm never willing to wait in line. I did that on Mother's Day at Cloud City over here. And like, I just didn't think about the line. And I'm like, we're not going there. Like, I'm not going to wait an hour. <laughs> I want to support the business, but I'm not doing that. Um, uh, do you like string cheese? I do like string cheese. I think for nostalgic purposes, as a as okay. a child, I I quite like it. And you know, when people grow up, they don't tend to eat that anymore. They grow, uh, they mature to it's... better cheeses and such. Yeah. But I like I like the string cheese. Um, that's actually not something that I see in in the UK or Europe. I think it's it's a really I think it's an American invention. I'm pretty sure. Well, it kind of goes along my whole like presidential policy around it would be like after a certain age you can't peel it because my whole thing is i just eat it i don't peel it oh you just bite into it yeah is that what you do or do you peel it or if you're gonna bite into it anyway then i i would suggest that you get fresh um buffalo mozzarella just straight up mozzarella yeah but the <laughs> buffalo one the fresh one okay yeah I'll I'll elevate try that. elevate your game i'll try that yeah um let's see here uh do you leave your butter out do you keep it in the fridge do you have butter? I don't know. If you need it. Um, well, m if people leave it out at room temperature, it's because they spread it onto bread. Um, I'm trying to eat healthier now. Uh, I guess that's like kind of one of the themes with all these food answers is that a lot of this stuff is like treats for me. I um, uh, have struggled a lot with my weight in my life. And uh, I mean, you can look at pictures of me from... Uh, earlier in my career, I was a lot heavier. And before that, uh, I was even heavier. So, uh, well, you look fantastic right now. I don't, I've never even thought about it. <laughs> thank you. It's, um, yeah, you know, I, I do political journalism and crime reporting, so I don't often talk about health related stuff, but like, um, our bodies are, they're not invincible. And when you're young, you think you can do anything. You think you live forever. You know, I just had a birthday recently and I had a, a family member pass away recently. And you just, you start thinking more about, you know, this is the one body you have. You really do have to take care of it. And um, unfortunately for most people, because they're busy, they just don't have time. They don't think about it. They eat a lot of things that are not nurturing to the body. And I'm not one of those people who advocates for like, organic only vegan only or or you know a lot of that stuff is unfortunately priced out for the average person mm -hmm. it's really unrealistic i mean you know the the shop the grocery bill of a regular grocery store is already so high imagine if you were to elevate that to like a whole foods type of diet um it's unsustainable for most working people um but i get it though i'm i think we're almost the same age and i'm like I've said my most of my adult life, like my metabolism's like so fast, but now it's slowing down and I have to make better choices sometimes. But, you know, I get it. I understand. Um, uh, if there was a, if you were forced to run a gigantic brand, is there a brand you'd want to run? I mean, you kind of, you do kind of run. Some you know, things. once upon a time, I wanted to open an artisanal ice cream place. Really? Yeah, in Portland. It was a, this was a long time ago. So it was before I, um, had any developed any interest in in news um but i was really interested in pursuing traditional southeast asian ice cream recipes okay. such as using durian or coconut milk or pandan and um i really thought that there could be a market for that in portland that sounds cool and yeah. I, I had a little cuisine art ice cream maker and i made some recipes at home that were actually really good and i thought Maybe one day it could be a business, um, maybe an alternate reality. But um, yeah, that was a, like a fantasy that. once upon a time. I like that. Um, 
feel free to say no to this, but I always ask people, did you, do you have a good meal recently or a local place you want to shout out? It doesn't have to be a restaurant, but just. Mm-hmm. This was actually last year. Um, Portland has a lot of Thai restaurants. There's a lot of competition. And that means that a lot of them have to elevate their game. Um, unfortunately, I don't actually really eat out in Portland anymore uh, on the times that I'm here because um, of a safety risk yeah, for me to be, be in public in Portland. Yeah. Uh, but last year I did get to try food from a Thai restaurant called Paddy uh, on Burnside. It's been around for a number of years and their food is really quite excellent. Uh, I highly recommend their uh, pandan pudding coconut dessert that they do mm-hmm. there. I haven't seen very many places do it. That sounds delicious. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, where's the main p- place people should support you? Is it because I know you have a couple places? Yeah. Yes. So I'm an independent journalist and. I know nobody wants to pay for news, but if you like the work that a journalist does, please see how you can support him or her or their publication. For me, um, people can support me at andy-ngo.com. And on there, you'll see the links to my book where you can get my book. Obviously, it's on Amazon and and major bookstores. Um, But there's different translations of it uh, uh, that are available. I have my locals, which is uh, ngolocals.com, nolocals.com. Uh, where you can sign up uh, for free. And if you want, you can choose a um, subscription as well, a monthly subscription where you can access some exclusive posts. I also have a Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash Andy Ngo. And um, people can also subscribe to me on on X. Mm -hmm. This is a feature that's different from following. When you subscribe to a user, um, you can um, commit to a monthly amount. And it's a way of supporting somebody you like who puts out good work. I, I put out a lot of posts, original reporting every day on my X account. It, it takes a lot of work. And I do it because I this it's really important, the type of information that needs to get out there. And I'm I'm really fortunate that I have a platform and a and a following. And so I'm I'm dedicated to working quite tirelessly to get out the information. And uh, I hope that people see the value in what I do and and choose to support me on one of those platforms I just named. Yeah, absolutely. I do. I subscribe to you on X at least. And I think to, if, any of those, so yeah, if any of those ways um, appeal to you just to support Andy, because he, like he's, you said, you are posting constantly. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to come up with it. And I'm a news junkie, but you're just on top of it with everything. And I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, this is kind of the new age of, uh, journalism and media and I think like this is the way to go like just support people so uh, but yeah thanks so much for coming today and uh, buy Andy's book if you can as well it'll break down everything uh, Antifa related um, but yeah thanks so much for talking today this was excellent my pleasure <laughs>